I'm Susan Stockdale. I'm the author and illustrator of picture books that celebrate nature for very young children. And I'm delighted to be here this morning to speak with you virtually at the 2021 Maryland Ornithological Society Annual Convention. Uh, I'm going to begin um, with a presentation um, about beginning with my childhood and my influences and how what role birds played in my life as a young child. And then I'm going to read two books to you that I created about birds and describe to you how I researched and wrote and illustrated them. So I will begin with this first slide. I grew up in Miami, Florida with its wonderful warm subtropical vegetation. I was surrounded by all this lush, you know, palm trees and beautiful flowers. I saw many, many birds when I was little. I'd go to the beach, I'd see pink flamingos, I'd see spoonbills. My mother took us to the parrot jungle, which was this fantastic venue, and I was dazzled by the birds bright colors and patterns. So I think at a very, very early age, I, I think I became a visual artist, but I also developed a real interest and appreciation for birds. I drew a lot when I was little. Um, that's me on the, uh, in holding up a picture of an animal, um, quite appropriately, since all my picture books are about animals. Um, I went to college and I majored in art, and you see a very fanciful, fictitious kind of image there. Um, sort of a fantasy image, but with birds at the center. Then I was a textile designer for many years where I designed uh, fabric for women's clothing that was sold at um, retail stores um, because I love creating detail. And um, I often created patterns that had birds as their theme. So birds really were sort of a part of my life from a very, very young age. And then I went to the zoo with my young children, and we saw a flamingo standing on one leg, sound asleep, and my children said, that's really interesting that a flamingo can sleep standing up. Bingo! That's how I got the idea for my very first picture book, Some Sleep Standing Up, which was about all the surprising ways in which animals sleep. Since then, I've created a number of other books, uh, a book about fishes, a book about striped animals, a book about how animals carry their babies all around the world, a book about camouflage, and so on and so forth. But today, of course, appropriately, I will be focusing on two books that I created about birds. I get my ideas outside. Um, I got my idea for this first book, Bird Show, which just came out this past month, um, while I was sitting outside and this northern cardinal was swooping around me. So beautiful. And I thought, it really looks like it's wearing a red coat. That's how it strikes me. And I thought, wait a minute, wouldn't it be fun to create a book in which I imagine birds' plumage as clothing? They're in a fashion show. Thus began my book called Bird Show. I'll read it to you now. I'll linger a little bit on each page because my poem is pretty spare. Um, and I want you to be able to see the illustrations. So, Bird Show. I soar through the sky, and like birds everywhere, I'm decked out in feathers and wear them with flair. I boast an outfit of every hue. My coat has one color. My jacket has two. I flaunt a full skirt of milky white lace. My apron is yellow. My dress has a face. I sport a vest that is dappled with dots. My suit has white speckles. My headdress has spots. I flash a tailcoat with curly Q flips. My train has two paddles. My fan has sharp tips. I don an elegant, free-flowing gown.
My scarf stripes are curvy. My plumes form a crown. All of us dress in our own special way and put on a fashion show every day. That's the end of my poem. At the end of the book, I have really important information about the birds. So I have a paragraph in which I summarize how their colors and patterns benefit them. And then I identify each bird that you've seen and tell a little bit about it and identify its native habitat. Then at the very end, I have a matching game. So pattern recognition is so important for children. First of all, this is a fun way to get them back into the book, paying attention to all the colors and patterns. Um, and secondly, it's, it's the foundation of math. It's so important. So um, for example, let's look at some of the patterns. Kids can look at this pattern and think, what could that possibly belong to? Look really closely. And then, oh, that belongs to the marvelous spatula tail, which is that beautiful Peruvian bird that waves its feather discs, which are called spatules during courtship. Such an elegant bird. I really loved positioning it in that way. They might look at this pattern. What could that be? Let's take a look. That belongs to the royal flycatcher, South American bird. Of course, it catches flies. It's fun when a bird's name conveys what it does for young children in particular, which is one of the reasons I actually chose this bird. Um, and the male and female flare that crest during court, the beautiful crest during courtship. What could this pattern belong to? Let's check it out. The great egret, which is um, in many continents, including uh, North America, and the male and female spread their long feather plumes out um, like a fan during courtship. Those were really fun to paint. I used a teeny tiny brush for all the, the white feathers. So now I've got my idea for my book and because this is a nonfiction picture book, of course I have to do a lot of research. I look at many, many different kinds of books. I look at really reliable websites, good websites like the Natural History Museum's website, the Smithsonian. I always consult with scientists. For this book, I consulted with two scientists, one of whom is pictured here, Dr. Carla Dove, She's the head of the Feather Identification Unit at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum. And I also worked with Dr. Stephen Lata at the National Aviary. So when I say I worked with them, what I mean is I create drafts, or actually I would typically send them sort of a final draft to say, how does this look? Is anything incorrect? And they might tweak things or make suggest things. Um, I would do the same thing with my images to make sure that my images within my stylization are accurate. That's really, really important, all that fact checking. I go to aviaries when I can to see these birds when I'm thinking about what's going to go in the book. And then I begin writing a list of the books that I'm considering. So this is just a, a list of candidates. I had a couple pages of these. I'm thinking what's going to be fun for kids to see? What's going to work with my words because I've got to be writing these words to match the birds too. Um, so the, the words that you see in red, highlighted in red, are birds that I include in the book. The golden pheasant, the cardinal, the Wilson's Bird of Paradise, you know, with the curlicue flips, the Amazonian flycatcher. Then I begin my writing process because now I'm, I'm getting a pretty good idea of the birds that I want to put in. Not totally sure, but I'm getting there. So I'm starting to write. So what I always do is create a word bank. So on the left, I have a word bank of um, words that have to do with clothing, body parts, fas uh, fashion in any way, um, color, pattern. So for example, boots, bow, breast, brown, cap, cheek, chest, clothes, coat, collar. I want to see what rhymes with them. The only thing on this list that I use in the book, crown and gown, I use those words, and face and lace. So word banks are really, really helpful. It's a great anchor for me when I'm trying to you know, match the word to the, to the, to the uh, bird. On the right is just a typical draft. That's what it looks like. It's very messy because I'm brainstorming. I'm coming up with ideas. I'm crossing things out. I'm thinking of alliteration. I'm thinking of rhyming words. Um, this is really an organic part of the process. 
And then of course I come up with my final text, which you see here, which is what I just read to you. So every word that you see in red is a rhyming word. Um, this is kind of sophisticated um, vocabulary for my young reader. The verbs that I'm using, boast, flaunt, sport, flash, dawn. But that's okay. They're going to be looking at the pictures. The pictures support the words. Um, and they'll typically have someone reading with them. Uh, and so it's wonderful to be enhancing the vocabulary. I love it. And um, I love coming up with those rhyming words. Rhyme is a great way for emerging readers to learn how, how to learn their literacy skills because they can be anticipating what the next word is. By the way, I also have a predictable verse pattern here, a long line of text, followed by a shorter one. I flaunt a full skirt of milky white lace. My apron is yellow. My, my dress has a face. So I count out the beats as I'm writing my words. I want to have a consistent cadence. Okay, this was the beginning of the book. I was going to write Birds Around the World Stage a Beautiful Show with feathery fashions that glimmer and glow. But then I realized, oops, first of all, not all birds glimmer and glow. And I don't want to give away that this is a, a show, that it's a fashion show. That's kind of my punchline at the end of the book. Instead, I really like, I soar through the sky. It's a great active muscular verb. And like birds everywhere, I'm, I'm, now I'm telling these kids, I'm decked out in feathers and wear them with flair. All birds have feathers. They're the only living creatures that do. So I'm really conveying an important fact right off the bat to my young reader, and I'm indicating what this book is going to be about. I'm also giving a little nod to the fact that it's going to be about appearance. The ending really changed. I was going to say, to see their display, there's no ticket or fee. The bird's fashion show is entirely free. Admission is simple. Just look way up high and watch all the beautiful birds flying by. I thought, wait a second, why am I talking about an admission fee, a ticket? Maybe kids would think about money. This was just an idea I had. This is why it's a draft. Um, also, birds don't just fly by. They can be perched next to us. So instead, I simplify. All of us dress in our own special way and put on a fashion show every day. And what I like about that is people dress in their own special way too. People look different. So it's really a celebration of difference and diversity, which I love. This is what the back matter looks like when I'm drafting it, just to give you an idea. Um, everything you see, see in pink or red is where my editor or one of my scientific consultants made a correction or asked me a question, or maybe my editor just uh, suggested another word to, for me to write more clearly. And that's what it looks like when it's finished. I work in my studio, which is where I am now. Um, let's see, I think you can see a picture I'm working on behind me for a book that's coming out in 2023. Uh, I work at my drafting table. I'm always surrounded by photo references when I'm, when I'm drawing. Um, I have my paints to the right. I work in acrylic paint. Um, I have my, my brushes to the right. I have fantastic natural light. Really great place to create. Um, I come up with a thumbnail dummy when I'm creating. Looks like this, just a little, just eight pieces of paper folded in half. You count the front and the back. 32 pages. My picture book is 32 pages. This is a working tool where I'm just working out what, what I'm going to be putting in the book. What's the order which I'm going to be placing the birds? So I just do very, very loose sketches like you see here. So this is just a tool. Then, because I just create pencil on paper, I just do all my drawings. Everything's by hand. Pencil on paper drawings and acrylic on paper paintings. Um, I put them up on the wall to see how they look. Do I want to change the order? Sometimes I do that. Then I create a storyboard. And this is something I send to my publisher so we can see exactly what's laid out on my 32 page book. Uh, you see at the top, I have my Mandarin duck that I showed you on page four and five. That's a double spread that goes across two pages. Then on page six, I have the Cardinal. Then on page seven, I have the Stellar's J. Then page eight and nine, double spread with the Great Egret. So there's patterning here as well. Double spread, single page image, single page image. Double spread, single page image, single page image. These things are all very intentional. I begin with my photo reference for every illustration I create. Here I've got my northern flicker, so beautiful. Love this bird. And now I begin drawing. I start with a pencil drawing, as I mentioned. I have the bird coming in diagonally on the top. I'm still thinking about the composition and I ended up having it bring um, 
food to its baby. I decided that there would be a nice thing to show that relationship in this illustration. What you see on the bottom is my final illustration. And now what I'm going to do is trace that illustration onto tracing paper, which you see on the top. Below the tracing paper is transfer paper. And transfer paper, behind that, is my Bristol paper. So I have three things, transfer paper, or tracing paper, transfer paper, Bristol paper. Down below, you see my Bristol paper on which I have transferred this image. You see those very light lines? Those are places where I'm going to be filling it in with paint, sort of like a coloring book. I begin blocking in my paint. I use acrylic paint. It comes in canisters like this or tubes. I love it. It's water-based. It dries very quickly. It's very forgiving in the sense that I can make mistakes and cover them up. I use all kinds of brushes, big fat brushes for background colors, uh, medium-sized brushes for like big shapes of the birds, um, really teeny tiny brushes for detail. Um, you can see the middle there. I have my palette where I'm mixing colors, some of which you can see up above. And, um, and on the far right is where I've actually mixed the colors before I apply them to make sure I'm happy with them. There's my final illustration. Cool colors in the tree trunk on the left, <clears throat> contrasted with the warm colors of the bird and the warm colors of the leaves. That creates dynamism when you have cool and warm colors um, that are juxtaposing with one another. And then I added that apple green background, which I think really gives the bird pun uh, the picture punch. The words, um, I don't put the words in. I just leave space for the words. I indicate where I want them to go to my art director. <clears throat> and um, I felt good about this picture. That was a really beautiful picture to create, and I love creating those little little dots that I, ca I call dots on its chest. <clears throat> Here's my cardinal, which inspired the book. <clears throat> I thought that the picture you see on the left was my final image, but in fact, I sent it to Dr. Carla Dove, and she said, it's probably not flying at night. And so I had to change that picture, which I did on the right. Now that picture on the right, very different. And the one on the left, of course, you see the sliver of the moon. So I just decided to put beautiful clouds behind it and have a little orange sun peeking out. And the orange sun, that orange matches the, the beak of the bird. And I really like that, that relationship between those two colors. I looked at my European starling. This is gonna be my bird that conveys what a speckle is. So it's such a great bird. And I was lucky enough to see its murmuration, which maybe some of you have seen. I just thought this was amazing how they, they do this when they roost in winter, flocking for safety, of course, because it would certainly make it hard for a predator to pick out a single, single bird from that flock. Anyway, so originally I was going to show it um, in the tall grass, because I had seen that photograph with it in grass. But Dr. Dove said, starlings don't forage in tall grass. Bird looks bill, but should be a bit longer. Okay, so I've got to make my bill longer, and I've got to really change that picture, which I did, of course. I like it in the snow, and I like the, I like the bright berries. I think that's just a, um, it's a very spare, but I, I think a, a, an illustration that works. And as a textile designer, this is what I love the most. It's coming in with a teeny tiny detail. So this is a close-up of, of its beautiful feathers. The superb bird of paradise from New Guinea. So the male unfurls his feathers in, upward into this sort of black oval shape that's highlighted by these brilliant blue feathers that really do look like a face, which is how I refer to it in the book. So it jumps around on the log and it's trying to, you know, woo the female. Um, so you can see my drawing is on the right. Um, make, I make lots of notes to myself, um, beak highlights, turquoise, light gray eyes. I'm, I'm writing all sorts of things to myself. So when I sent this to Carla Dove, this was actually a final illustration. Um, I had, I think, not a very good photo reference, and she said the female breast should be more barred than spotted, and the eye spots seem too blue. They should be pale bluish white. So as you can see on the left, the female's breast is indeed barred, and on the right, excuse me, is spotted, and on the right I changed it so that it's barred. And I did indeed, you know, change the color of the eyes. So that was, that was a fun picture. Um, it's just an amazing bird. And of course, there are videos of this dance, which are absolutely dazzling. Okay, the greater sage grouse, the largest grouse in North America. So the male, of course, fans his tail to attract a female. So I chose this bird because I'm indicating to kids what a sharp tip is. Um, 
I think this bird really, really does uh, exemplify what a sharp tip looks like. Um, and on the upper left, it gives you an idea of the kinds of illustrations I'm, or photographs I'm looking at when I'm illustrating. And I look at the habitat, this, the color of the sage bush. Um, had a lot of turquoise in it, which I tried to pull into my picture. So I love doing all those stripes on the tail and, and the different colors of gray and the feathers. Um, the golden pheasant from, in China and the uh, gray crowned crane, an African bird. Um, I just thought these were just perfect for my fashion show. They're so fantastic looking. Um, so at first I was gonna show them with a habitat in the background like you see in the bottom. So, you know, I'm playing around with my drawings. But then I, I worked at the National Portrait Gallery for a while as a gallery educator. Um, I would always go through and see, you know, all these wonderful presidential portraits. Um, and they would often, you know, look like this. And I thought, you know, it'd be much more fun just to show the birds facing each other like they're in a portrait, <laughs> like this. And uh, my art director had the fun idea to come up with really brilliant colors for the borders. So this is an important part of the design of the book. I um, mean, we really punch up the colors, that bright pink and that bright orange, which I think is totally fun. So I like these two birds looking at each other like they're in a formal portrait. So um, we're getting to the end of this book, and this is a line of text that reads, all of us dress in our own special way. And I was thinking about putting a hummingbird in the desert. Um, hummingbirds are beautiful. I thought that would be a wonderful addition to the book. Um, and I thought being in the desert would be an interesting habitat, just a different habitat for the book. But then I remembered, wait a minute, I've seen the most amazing bird that looks like it's in a fashion show. Um, and that was during my trip to Costa Rica when I was lucky enough to see the resplendent Quetzal, which it's a rare sighting. I was in a small tour group and my tour guide um, had this you know, really powerful telescope and we all gathered around and we waited patiently for, for a while. And then finally way up high, I could see the resplendent Quetzal um, with those beautiful um, streamers that the male grows. Um, during mating season to, um, you know, attract a, a mate, a female. And I thought, well, that's the, that's the bird I should show, my goodness. Uh, so first I came up with this horizontal drawing where I had the female looking at the male. But then I thought, well, wait a minute, I should not have a horizontal, a horizontal image when it's got this beautiful long tail. Vertical image, so I can show it. So on the left, um, I have a, a bird that was just too large because I really can't emphasize its long tail. But on the right, I made it much smaller so that I can really, really, really show that. So then I have like the bromeliad and some of the vegetation. Um, again, I knew where I was gonna be placing the words in the lower left, so I left space for that. Um, I'm thinking where my, where my gutter is gonna go, where the pages are coming together. I, that would be sort of right below, a little bit below the white part of its tail. Um, that's fine, that's not gonna be interfering with anything. I never want my gutter to be, you know, um, interfering with anything that's um, distracting. Um, so I, I was happy with that final picture of that really beautiful resplendent Quetzal. And there's the detail. This is the part that I love with my teeny tiny brush as a, having been a textile designer. I love that. This is the last picture in the book uh, that I'll show you. This is the Scarlet Macaw. Um, and of course, when I was recently, I found out that the macaw is mate for life, which I thought was a really wonderful thing to learn. And they often fly with their wings touching, which is beautiful. Um, I was going to show children looking up at the birds like this, um, sort of in awe, but then I thought, I, I feel like the focus is too much on their faces, and I really didn't want that. I want the focus to be on the birds. I also thought it might not be safe, perhaps, or even probable that birds would swoop that closely to the children. Um, and so I changed this picture quite a bit, put the birds uh, and the children um, in an ocean setting. So they're swooping over the ocean and the kids are looking up in awe. You can tell they're marveling because the boy has his hand extended. Like he's looking up going, oh my goodness, look at that. And um, I did change their clothing quite a bit. Uh, I kind of made the girl more contemporary. I put a baseball cap on her, uh, changed her color, her shirt. I made her shirt green to relate to the teeny tiny palm trees you see in the background. I changed the boy's outfit. I wanted him to have a, a red shirt to relate to the red in the Scarlet Macaws. Um, I like the airiness of this feel of this picture. Very, very airy. And I do, I think in all my books to date, I've shown children on the last page interacting with the theme of my book in some way. So they're about animals, but then on the last page, it's like, we're in the world with these wonderful animals. How great is that? So that was Bird Show. So the last book I'll show you 
is a book um, called Bring on the Birds. And this was inspired, again, a little outdoor experience. A robin built its nest over our front door. Um, in a matter of hours, it happened very, very quickly. And it was very exciting. Uh, we got to watch it from the inside because he had that sort of glass over our front door. And I mean, this was incredible. We watched the whole thing, the father bringing the wor wor words, worms to the mother as she sat patiently on, on her eggs and so on. And I, I have to tell you, this next, I did not make up this next picture, but my, my son was home at the time and we, we had a ladder up because we were getting a ladder. We were walking, watching very cautiously away from the window, but watching the spectacle. I mean, the birds didn't even know we were there, uh, but we came away and this is what we found. So we had a table next to the uh, ladder and I think the, the cat jumped up on the table and then jumped up on the ladder and was just having a heyday watching this scenario. But this, this experience, really inspired this, this next book. So really, Bird Show is about a, a appearance, and Bring on the Birds is more about birds doing things. So you'll see there is just one verb after another. So Bring on the Birds. So there I have my wonderful toucan on the cover. Swooping Birds. Whooping Birds. Birds with puffy chests. Dancing birds, diving birds, birds with puffy crests, hanging birds, hiding birds, birds with jagged bills, hummingbirds, Drumming birds, birds with bills that drill. Skimming birds, swimming birds, birds with tails held high, racing birds, riding birds, Birds that never fly. Dull or dazzling colors, long or little legs. All of them have feathers and all are hatched from eggs. So you can see there's just a lot of verbs and a lot of fun language for children in this book. And I was thinking, how am I going to unite all these disparate birds in my ending? But I was so happy with my ending because, again, I'm conveying all birds have feathers and they're all hatched from eggs. So I got in these two salient points at the end of the book. And then I like having children looking at um, birds that they might see, you know, in our country, the, um, the robins there. But actually, when I did this picture, I actually found, just coincidentally, a, um, a turquoise bird, bird egg outside. So I carefully put on some gloves, I brought it inside, and I, and I had it in my studio when I painted that color because it really are it's so turquoise. So as with my other book, Bird Show, in Bring on the Birds, I have an addendum um, where I give uh, information about each bird and its behavior and identify its natural habitat. And again, I worked with scientists on this book just as I did uh, Bird Show. Okay. So for this one, again, just it's the same process. On the left, that was my very first draft for this book because already it's fun for me to kind of look back and see what I was thinking. I mean, I just thought I'm going to do a book about birds and I'm just going to use a bunch of verbs. So it starts out, I mean, I'm just playing around. Slow birds, swift birds, birds that stay on land, miming birds, and I have in parentheses parrots, climbing birds, birds that always stand or birds that live in sand. I'm just brainstorming. This is the fun part of the creative process. And it's why I keep coming back to doing these picture books because it's so glorious to, to come up with, with ideas. It all begins with an idea. You know, night birds, bright birds, uh, tiny birds, shiny birds. So I didn't use a lot of this language, but I did use some of it. Um, then on the right, you see swooping, whooping. These are the, this is the final, final text. Dancing, diving. Keep in mind, I really, when I, where I could, I used, um, you know, verbs that start with the same letter. So I kind of try to create like a puzzle for myself. To, the tighter I can make my conceit, the more successful the writing is going to be. 
I was lucky to go to the Galapagos Islands. Lucky me. And I saw um, the blue-footed booby, and I saw the female and male do their amazing mating dance. So when I saw it, at first the, the, the male started dancing, and the female looked very indifferent, and then she joined the dance. Uh, but there I am next to the blue-footed booby, and the Galapagos Islands was the trip of a lifetime, that's for sure. So this was my first drawing. Um, the, the female is somewhat smaller, and so I wrote down smaller you know, for the female, taller for the male. Uh, the right is my final drawing. Now, because I'd you know, been there, I, I knew where I was going to be headed with the colors and so on. I'm starting to mix my background color here. And by the way, I saved my colors in canisters. So you can see there I say background boobies. Because if I make a mistake and I want to go back and mix a new color for the background, it's not going to be the same color. I need to have my colors saved in canisters. So I start blo blocking in my color like you see there on the left and blocking in the boobies. And then um, I'd seen the vegetation uh, that surrounds them. And there was, I'm not sure what it was called, but it was a lot of red. It was so beautiful. So I knew that I was going to be, there's a picture of it. Final illustration. So again, back to my textile design. I, I really had fun doing all those teeny details. Um, and the boobies were so fun. I love finding out how I'm going to stylize them. You know, they have those kind of, kind of like, you know, curvy lines kind of around their head. And of course, their feet are just fantastic. Okay, so this is my great horned owl, um, swooping owl, the first owl in the, the first picture in the book. So um, I look at a photograph like this. I think, how am I going to illustrate this? How, how am I going to approach this? Many, many drawings for this. <clears throat> One, it was actually chasing, um, you know, a little mouse or whatever, rat maybe. And then holding it in its beak, and I thought, well, that's not very pretty. I don't want that to be the first picture on the page. I'm the artist, so I get to decide. Then I had it holding a snake. And when I sent it to one of my scientific consultants, they said, oh, no, they don't, they don't feed on snakes. They go after, um, you know, other kinds of little, like, little mammals, like rabbits or things like that. And they have very powerful talons. So I thought, well, you know what? I don't have to have an animal. I don't, it doesn't have to be holding an animal. I can, I'm going to address the kinds of things it does in the back matter, in the addendum. And so... Um, picture. I like this so much better. It's just, it's beautiful. I love the, the, the patterns on the patterns, you know, on the, on the wings and on its head and the different colors and the sliver of the moon. And it's just flying over some sort of pasture. Um, so here's my broad-tailed hummingbird. And so I do write notes to myself. Um, I say, okay, it was going to go, you can see that how I was headed with my illustration. I wrote two cliche Use hibiscus flower instead. I just seen a lot of pictures that kind of look like this. And I thought, why not kind of put it more inside a flower? So let's see. I was looking at what a hibiscus looks like. And then I kind of began putting it inside the flower. You know, it's got that long beak for getting its nectar. And then I changed it. Uh, let's see. Let me go back to that. Oops, hard for me to go back. Well, that's okay. Anyway, I, I had it more inside the flower, which I, I think was a much more successful image. Um, here I have my, my Victoria crown pigeon, which is so beautiful. Uh, I think it's the largest pigeon in, in North America. And the male bows down before the female uh, to woo her. Um, I actually went to the Smithsonian, and um, Dr. Dove took me to the flat files in this vast basement at the Natural History Museum. And she pulled out a, a, a file that had samples of Victoria crown pigeons when I was researching the book so I could get a closer look. That was a very exciting field trip. Um, and here's my image for them. And I had little ants kind of in the ground, just little things for kids to look at. Those were very, very delicate to paint, very, very delicate uh, process. Okay, my red-bellied woodpecker. Um, so when I'm looking at these animals, of course, as I mentioned before, I'm also looking at their, at their habitat. I can put them in various habitats, different trees. Um, so I'm thinking about the kind of patterns I want to put on the tree and the kind of leaves I want surrounding them. This is such a pretty bird. Um, I knew I was going to have a great time painting, um, you know, those, those black and white stripes and that beautiful red head. And so there's the final image. So this, of course, will be a double spread. It's going across two pages. Again, I'm thinking about where the text is going to go. It's going to be in the lower right. I'm thinking about the gutter. Again, not, nothing's going to be, um, you know, distracting in the gutter. It's not going to be like where a face is of an animal or anything like that. So those are all things that I'm thinking about. And it was fun that I mean I decided when it was like beep 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 
getting into the tree to look for a worm and have just have little bits of the of the wood kind of flying off. Okay, the greater roadrunner. I believe it's the fastest running bird in North America. Um, these are so funny, and I think their long legs help them run after, you know, lizards and things like that. So, of course, I'm looking at all sorts of references, as I mentioned to you. Um, I'm looking at the cactus plants. I know this is going to be a really fun picture to do because it's going to be a different environment. It's going to be the desert. So, um, I knew that I wanted it holding a lizard. It's just caught, caught its meal. And um, you can see how the, how the habitat changes sometimes. I just felt in that image on the left that that was, um, the background was just somewhat distracting. Um, I didn't really want to have those large cactuses there. I also wanted you to see its tail. So again, when I'm creating my picture books, I'm always thinking about the focus is on the animals. That's the focus. So I don't want anything that's intruding on that. I want things that are embellishing that. So I like the fact that in this picture, you can see the tail, you know, very, very nicely. And then of course on my teeny tiny, cacti in the background. And I had fun with the, my, um, my rock formation. I mean, that's very, very stylized. But again, that's, that's my artistry. And that's the reason that I don't use photographs for my books. That's why I paint them, because I get to express um, my vision of how it looks. The indigo buntings. So um, I really wanted to have a picture in which I contrasted uh, a dull female and a, and a brilliantly colored male and explain in the back matter that the, the female is often you know, dull so that she can go undetected while she's caring for her chicks on her nest and the male is vibrant, uh, vibrantly colored to attract a female. Uh, <clears throat> so I wanted to explain that in my text. So on the left, I'm trying to figure out my illustration here. You can see I have which bird is gonna be dull, which bird is gonna be brilliant. I've actually written that on the birds that I'm gonna be depicting. Um, this is a good example of how I feel like paring things down often makes them so much more successful. I, I knew I wanted to have a really spare image where I'm just highlighting the birds. They're on, on the, the, the branches. Um, I had too many branches on the left and I didn't like the shapes of the branches. I wanted them to be very like streamlined. Um, I just love painting even that like golden sliver of color on the male with that beautiful brilliant turquoise. It's just so pretty. It's such a pleasure. Now look at the words, dull or dazzling. So I like the alliteration and I'm giving a little lot of thought to what am I conveying to my kids? These are books to educate. I'm all about educating kids. So what does dull mean? So if they're sitting with a caregiver or their parent, whomever, if they don't know and they're four years old, well, what is dull? Well, it looks like that bird, not very pretty. What is dazzling? That looks like the male bird. So they're learning wonderful vibrant language. Okay, my ruffed grouse. So I called it the drumming bird because my research showed that it really makes a drumming sound when it stands up on a log and it flaps its wings and the sound can actually be heard in, in the forest. Um, and so this was my first idea. Um, this, this picture actually changed quite a bit. Right, so I have, it's always on a log. So on the left, um, I have written down log. Do I want trees in the background? I decided I did want a tree in the background, but I didn't want all the stuff that you see in the right hand side. Uh, so, you know, again, you're tweaking. You're always like thinking, what's going to make this most successful? Okay, now I'm getting a better idea of what I want to do with my bird on the left hand side. And then I changed this position slightly. I liked it just kind of moving to the right a little bit. Um, and I kind of have, I don't know, kind of like straw or something down for the ground. And I just like that one bird that's kind of, that one tree trunk that's going off with the branches coming down and just a little bit of green poking up that kind of helps um, highlight its, its uh, beautiful feathers. This is my beautiful um, ptarmigan, the, the white-tailed ptarmigan. I think that's white, let's see. Yeah, white-tailed ptarmigan. I always want to call it the white ptarmigan. Um, so of course this changes colors to blend with its surroundings throughout in every season. Um, it's so interesting how sometimes the, what I think is going to be the simplest illustration because the one becomes the one that's most challenging. Um, here I was looking at them in the snow. I knew I wanted to show them in the snow. I thought that would be an interesting composition. I put these birds in so many different settings. You can't even imagine. Um, this is just one of many that I was considering on the left. And then that was the one on the right that I was considering. Do I like that one? 
And that I think that was almost the one that I finally ended with, is the one that you see on the right, is all the kind of huddled together. Um, it was kind of tricky because when you're creating illustrations, you have to make sure that when the artwork is scanned, that the colors are going to are going to be you know visible and my lines were pretty faint to outline these birds and so I thought oh my goodness I hope it's going to work but kids can see them and then in the back matter I explain you know that they're camouflage you can barely see them at all it's kind of amazing so um that is my presentation on my books on bird show and bring on the birds um you if you are interested in my books for your young reader you can get them at Amazon online or Barnes and Noble or bookshop.org, which represents independent books. So I always recommend that people go there first or order them at your local bookstore. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me in any way, um, this is my uh, website on the top and my email address and Twitter and Instagram. And it's been such a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I really feel honored that I was able to speak to people who are bird lovers and enthusiasts and know so much more about birds than I do. Um, I hope you've enjoyed learning about the process of how a children's book author and illustrator creates these books and all that goes into it. And certainly in my case, I try very hard to make sure I'm conveying, you know, really accurate information to kids and getting them to appreciate birds and, um, and appreciate how they look and, and a lot about their behavior. You know, there's just, they're so, such marvelous creatures. And the great thing, of course, is Kids don't have to go to a zoo to see them like they would have to for a zebra or an elephant. They're just all around us, which is so marvelous. So thank you so much for this pleasure. And I hope that um, everyone enjoys the conference. Bye-bye.